good morning, everybody. My name is Sarah Clark. I'm the program manager for web developer training at Google in Mountain View, California. And my background, just really briefly, is I've been teaching developers since 1989. I was the first training engineer hired at Google. Uh, Google, no, sorry, Apple. Ugh, mess up already. OK. I was the first one hired at Apple. Hopefully, the editors will fix that. Um, I was hired at Apple, and I've worked at Hewlett Packard and Verifone and a few startups you've never heard of. And then I wound up at Google about two years ago. So my specialty has always been training software developers. And my team and I wrote this course. So it's going to be a pretty busy two days. Let me give you a look at what the schedule looks like. First off, there's the course materials. But you have a piece of paper on your desks with that same information. So you'll be able to pull it up from there. What we're doing today, we'll do a, an introduction. Well, just introduce myself, introduce you. We've done that. We're done there. Why build progressive web applications? So we'll give a bit of reasoning for why you want to build PWAs. New techniques for responsive design. So a lot of people, let me just ask this question. How many people in here, when they use, think responsive design, use something like Bootstrap? Right? Almost every hand in the room. So it turns out that's one way of doing it, but there's some other ways of thinking about it that might be better for mobile. So I'll tell you what our designers in Google have said in terms of thinking about responsive design. Now, part of responsive design is dealing with images. And until recently, they were kind of tough to deal with. And they were often the single largest thing in your page in terms of uh, weight. So we'll work with responsive images, being able to automatically select the best image for your screen size, so the smallest, most useful one. We'll then, probably right around lunchtime, talk about a couple of core technologies that you might have seen, might not have seen yet, called Fetch and Promises. These are new technologies in JavaScript that make it easier to get files from the network and form the basis for service workers. So then after that, we'll do a quick introduction to service workers and then a, a quick discussion, what's called the offline quick start. How do I take an existing application and convert it into a PWA? And there's a lab there. So you'll actually take an existing website and make it work offline. And it's actually pretty fast and easy. We'll then use the Lighthouse tool to audit an existing site. So we'll take a look at, you'll know, use audit, um, Lighthouse. We'll look at what the site's doing um, and make it better. And then finally, we'll talk about different PWA architectures. What are the trade-offs that you need to make when you're building a progressive web app? Now, this is what's scheduled today. And if I look at the actual schedule spreadsheet, what it says is, is that this ends about 4 o'clock. So depending on how you're feeling and how time's going, we may pick up one or two things from tomorrow morning. Because then that means that we can pick up some advanced technologies that don't normally get into the two-day course, like push notifications. So I may add one or two things at the end of the day. But that's so that tomorrow, I can give you things you wouldn't normally see. I think we can pack everything in on this course, including the extras. If at any point you have questions, you want to know something, just speak up. You don't have to wait for the end of a talk. Um, I would much rather you ask me when you're not sure about something, because you're just going to learn better. And frankly, if you're wondering about it, probably everybody else in the room is too. So don't be shy. OK, so let's talk about why build progressive web apps. Well, we're going to start with a little bit of deep history, just because it's entertaining. Around 1822, this is the difference engine. All right, you could argue this was the first computer. Babbage built it basically to, com to compute differential values. The thing is, that was a computer with one application. And it took almost 200 years to build the next application. I don't think you want to take 200 years to ship your app. So things are getting faster. So let's move up oh, about 150 years. Anybody remember these? Yeah. Yep. A few people. A few people are saying, what is that? <laughs> All you youngins. So the floppy disk. So this was you know, back in the, the, early, the 80s, 90s, 
where to get an application you would go to the store and you would buy a box and some of the bigger applications needed 10 of these discs. You could buy a map on CD-ROM. Good luck getting it updated, but you know you could get a map, you could do planning, you could print things out, pan and scroll, pan and zoom, great. But you know, terrible if you had to get it on the go, but we didn't have Wi-Fi. We didn't have, you know, the wireless network. We just had phones that were the size of big bricks. So move forward a few more years. And Google Maps comes out. Works on the desktop, works on your phone, pan and zoom. Did you have to go to the store and buy this? Nope, it was just there on the web. And that, in a nutshell, is why we like the progressive web app so much, because somebody doesn't have to go to a store and buy it. Now, in some phones, you can't even go to an app store. You buy the phone, your things are sideloaded at the time you purchase it, and that's it. So some of those phones have maybe three apps for life, but they still get to the web. And so as a developer, as a developer agency, if you want to get your app in front of people and get it installed, nowadays, often your only avenue left is to install it off the web. And the web has gotten a lot faster, right? It used to be kind of slow, but the JavaScript engines have gotten really good at speeding things up. We have native capabilities. Nowadays, we can build apps that scroll and display at 60 frames per second. They look just like a native app, and they feel like one, too. So that, in a very, very short nutshell, is what progressive web apps are about, but let's dive a little deeper. So we say the hardest problem with software is distribution. Right, getting it in your customers' hands, and that's why we like the web so much. But even then, so we're here, we're in Bangalore, we have good connectivity. What happens if you go out in the countryside? Right, maybe you don't have connectivity, or it's intermittent. So you want something that works, not just when the network works. Right, the web used to be, you had to be on the network all the time, or you had nothing. So progressive web apps have a built-in cache that you as a developer control that lets you cache things offline. And there's a database in the phone, so you can even pull data and hold it there. How many of you have actually played with Flipkart Lite or even used it? Right, about half of the room. So Flipkart took all the features of a native app and actually put them in a web application. And you can shop, you can buy things, you can look at product, and if you go offline, it remembers the things you've looked at. You can still look at old orders. You can still look at things you browsed before. It still works when you're offline. A really good offline app, you'd even be able to compose the order. And then when you went online, have it pop up a notice saying, hey, I see you're back online. Do you want to send the order now? So we're working on solving the problem, not just of distribution, but of an app that works even when your network doesn't. So let's talk about usage. For a long time, there was this huge debate, web app versus native app. And the market tended to lean towards native apps. And I don't, I don't disagree, because they were sexy. They were fun. And I used to teach iOS development, so I used to stand on that side of the aisle. And if you look at it, people spend 87% of their time, on average, in native apps versus 13% of their time on the web. So you might think, oh, well, why am I even looking at a web thing? Well, as I said, sometimes you get phones with only a couple of things installed. But 80% of time is spent in the user's top three applications. So if you're not one of those top three native apps, the chances are you're not even going to get seen. But if we look at capabilities here, the web's kind of has been low capability. Native apps have been pretty high capability. But the reach of an app, so the reach of a native app has been fairly low. Once it's installed, three or four of them maybe get used, whereas the web has a big reach. And the same time that people use three or four native apps, they'll use over a hundred different sites on their phones. So much easier to become one of those sites. And then if you can become a site that installs like an application with that kind of speed and ease, you can get people to come over and use you. And that's what progressive web apps are about, is really bridging the capability of native apps with the reach of the web. 
This is one example. I really, I probably should have replaced it. You can tell it's a little old. Talking about Bernie Sanders. So this was taken back uh, before the US election. This is the Washington Post. They built one of the first progressive web apps. So you could read news. You would actually open up the, the you would go to the page. It installed as a progressive web app. Um, it would look ahead. It would store your future articles in a certain section. So then you could go offline and actually flip through and read those articles. It was really quite nice. Now what's interesting to notice here is this still has a browser bar on top. This is on a first view. So on my second view, that browser Chrome actually goes away. And it's a full screen application. The browser will pop up a note asking if you want to add it to the home screen. And if you say yes, come on. There it is on the home screen. Click on that. I get a launch of the splash screen, and now I have the full screen experience, no browser Chrome. If I look at the apps list, it shows up as a regular app. It doesn't show up as Chrome and a window in Chrome. It shows up as an app itself. So you really look like an app to your users, your product does. So this is all about removing friction. This is all about getting rid of the steps required to install an app. So interesting fact, by the way, about removing friction. Let me back up for a moment. <coughs> the studies we've done say that ev for every step it takes to get or install an application, you lose 20% of your users. So if an app requires going to the App Store, 20% won't do it. Once you get to the App Store, 20, you have to go find the app, 20% of people will stop there. And so on, so to the point where Usually, only about a quarter of the people who go, who you say, hey, come install my native app. If you're lucky, maybe a quarter of the people will do it. But on the web, what friction is there? You're already on the page. At most, you hit a button that says add to home screen, or you dismiss it. So what did we need to be able to do that? So we need reliable performance. We needed to be able to work offline, work from cache, work from a, a database. We needed push notifications. These are really important in, nat in native applications. And progressive web apps can do push. So it's not normally scheduled as part of the two-day course, but I'm pretty sure we can fit this in. So that's, I'll be adding a little bit at the end of the day today so we can get to push tomorrow. And then the home screen icon, the ability to look like a regular home screen application. Now, why performance? Well, because faster matters. Did you know that if somebody doesn't see that half of the users that don't find what they want in the first 10 seconds will leave your page? Actually, the number is now 65, is 58%. It's almost 60%. More than half of your users, if they don't see what they want in 10 seconds, are gone. In fact, even at three seconds, 20% of people are gone. How many of your apps, how many of your web pages load in less than three seconds? Hmm, not seeing a lot of hands. <laughs> I'm seeing hands. That, well, let's be honest. That's not the easiest thing to do, right? And uh, I have had to, so how many people in here are developers? How many people here are designers? Oh, good. OK, OK, I see like one designer hand. So I have fought with designers who say, oh yeah, 10 seconds to load the page, no problem. People will stay. My thing looks so beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I have fought with them a lot. And then I go in and cache and compress and do everything I can to get it fast and tell them, keep your hands off of those settings over there. <laughs> but I love good designers. So don't get me wrong, but there is this tension between them. And so getting your page down to this 3.3 seconds or even 2.4 seconds is difficult. But what if it was sitting in a cache on your phone so it loaded instantly? Right? That will probably be the easiest performance hack you ever do. That, then you start worrying about runtime performance. But you know, we'll talk about that one later. But faster is much better if you want to keep your people. And most sites, look at this, the majority of the top 1,000 sites are 3.3 seconds or, or higher, really. So
So, okay, this number is a little different than what we have there. Different studies says 40% of users bounce out from sites that take longer than three seconds to load. That's not a good number. So service workers can help you out. What is a service worker? This is the short version. So a service worker is a proxy that sits inside the browser. It's actually written as part of natively as the browser. So like in Chrome, it's C++ internally. But it's controlled by JavaScript. So you tell the service worker to run a JavaScript. And what that script does is it takes your files that you need and puts them in a special cache. Now, this is not the browser cache, because the browser cache doesn't work when you're offline. This is a new cache, a new additional cache that you control. You control what files go in it. You control the lifetime. You control the size. This is completely flexible and under your control. In fact, it's almost too flexible sometimes. And we'll give you a set of tools to write a lot of the code that manages it. Make your life simpler. Sure, go ahead, question. OK, the question is, is service worker and the cache browser independent? So like most new features on the web, different browsers implement at different rates. Um, at the moment, Chrome and Mozilla and Edge and have all built it in. Samsung Internet has it. Um, other browsers are, have said that it's in their plans. So like Apple has said it's in Safari's plan. Um, I don't remember, I'm sorry to say, what UC is doing. Now, this doesn't apply to server-rendered browsers such as Opera Mini. And that's the one thing that's the most difficult, I know, for most of the people in the room, is Opera Mini has its own unique uh, way of doing things and doing everything on the server. So this will not apply to server-rendered browsers. So you control the cache. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go right ahead. So can I polyfill the service worker? Um, so there was a proof of concept service worker done as a polyfill, but it's not something you want to use in production. It's not really polyfillable because a polyfill is normally something you could write and run entirely in JavaScript. But the service worker actually lives inside of the browser as a network proxy, and so it needs internal access to the networking chain. So instead, what we recommend is that you do progressive enhancement. So you build your app to work without the service worker, right? Just like you would for any other site. You build it to work on a range of browsers. Um, you build a baseline experience. You layer things on as you get progressively better browsers. And w excuse me, one of those layers would be if the service worker exists, then load the service worker script, and suddenly now you have the cache, and you have the push notifications and all of that. But it is a progressive enhancement. It is not something you'll be able to polyfill across everything, because it's just so foundational into the browser. And it's a great question. Thank you. Then what happens with the service worker is once you have something in cache, the service worker actually intercepts all of your network events. So when your app, when the browser goes to fetch a file, or your app does a XML HTTP request or uses the fetch command, um, that actually gets routed through the service worker. And the service worker can actually decide to handle the request, usually by going to the cache or going to a database, not shown here, and pulling the data and returning it, which is how you get offline operation. Now, without a service worker, you still write the same application here. You just don't have the enhancements that the service worker brings. So the Guardian in the UK built a progressive web app. Less than one second median load time. That's pretty amazing. The app overall became four times faster. Now, does that mean it took four seconds before? Yeah, sometimes it took a little longer. But this four times faster also includes the time it takes to pull images off the network. If I, ha if I don't have a bunch of requests already in flight, I can get the images faster because they're not competing with other resources for the network. And it uses 10 times less data. You know, how many people here have you know, unlimited data plans? Not very many, right? Yeah, laughter from the room. 
right? You pay for the data you use. So the less data your application can use, big win for your users. And as a business, big win for usage because you'll actually get people to come and use the site. Now, there's another thing you can do here. How many people have heard of Accelerated Mobile Pages, AMP? Right? Big chunk of the room. We've done a lot of promotion on it. AMP is just a web, it's a web page. It uses a subset of HTML tags. Basically, we looked at everything in an HTML page that could be slow and took it out. So we have a subset of tags that are easy to style by default. We do have a script tag, but we limit what you can put in there. And a lot of the things you would have run client side, like a lot of the analytics, we actually run on the server side instead, which means it's not getting, tr it means that I don't have to download a bunch of scripts to your browser. I don't have to use your browser's JavaScript engine to run all of these. I can run that server side and save a lot of time. So AMP is a wonderfully fast approach. If you're building sites based on AMP, you get a client that comes to you and says, we're a publisher, we want to do this. You can include AMP install service worker as one of the tags in your page, and you'll get service worker, you get PWA support for free, just automatically. The other thing you can do is this. There are progressive web apps that use AMP for their pages. You have the core shell, kind of the navigation parts of your app that you've written, and then the leaf pages, the content at the edges can be AMP if you choose. And this is all we're really going to say on, on accelerated mobile pages. It's well documented online. Uh, if you do the code labs, they're pretty quick and easy to do. So it's worth a look, especially if you work with people who do a lot of publishing, a lot of very content driven uh, publishing. This is a way to go. So in fact, the Washington Post example I told you before uses AMP as their content format. So it loads fast everywhere, not just in a progressive web app. <coughs> now, if you're building progressive web apps, the Chrome developer tools now have a lot of things to help you out. If you go into Chrome Dev Tools and you go to the application tab, by the way, there are also things in the Mozilla developer tools. So if you're using Firefox, there's service worker support specifically in the dev tools there too. But in Chrome, under application tab, you have a manifest editing page. This is where you specify things like the icon, the theme color, which colors the top and bottom of the screen to match your application's theme. Uh, it controls whether or not you want this, the Chrome on the top and the bottom. Do you want full screen experience or not? And a few other settings. This is normally a JSON style file that's a little bit of a hassle to edit by hand, but this built-in editing panel makes that pretty easy to set up. There's also, if you see up here, there's a special tab for managing service workers. There are now tabs added for IndexedDB um, and for the custom cache storage. The other thing we'll get to a little later today is Lighthouse. So how many people have used um, page speed test? Right, most of the room. Cool, right? You like to build performant applications. So page speed test looks at your page and tells you where to change things to tune it up. Lighthouse looks at your page and tells you what can you do to make a better progressive web app. So it's like page speed test except it's built with a focus on PWAs rather than raw page speed. Now, there's a lot of overlap between the two. Um, and sometimes the advice they give is a little different because the focuses are slightly different. But they're both great tools. You'll get to use this later today. This is also open source. It's on GitHub, a Google Chrome account, Lighthouse. You'll find that a lot of the tools I'm showing you today are available open source. We've been open sourcing a bunch of things. Incidentally, this class is also open source. Um, it's all, like, all the, the textbook, the labs, all of that is all on GitHub and Gitbooks. So feel free when you get back to your offices, share it. You know, if you need to walk through a module of people, whatever, it's there. 
It's for you to use. I'm not open source, though. There's only one of me. A little hard to pass around. <laughs> That's true. If your phone gives away secrets on the recording, the editors might make it louder. Let's talk about a couple of interesting things. I'm, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on these, but two new features of progressive web apps. So we talked about fast loading from the cache. I mentioned uh, push notifications, right? I mentioned add to home screen. But there's also now a web payments API. Because if you look at the cart abandonment rate for e-commerce, meaning how many people put something in the cart and then never finish the checkout, 95%. Huge number of people give up before they buy something because they have to fill out this big form. And autofill helps, except when it's not done right and things are, been, things are going into the wrong fields. Right? It becomes frustrating. So web payments is meant to actually get rid of that frustration. The other big place it's frustrating is logging in. So there's a credential management API that is designed such that if your site supports it, it can log the user in if they've already authenticated to their phone. They don't have to go looking for name and password. And it's tied to that specific device and that specific user. So let's take a really fast look at those. So an example of web payments here would be Shopify. Here's a cart. Checkout button at the bottom. I tap on the button, and the browser slides up this display and says, OK, here's your cost. Here's where it's shipping. Here's the payment card you've been using. If that's all good, you tap pay. One click. Now, if this address isn't right for you or this payment isn't right for you, you can tap on these and change them. And the browser will remember them. The other nice thing about this is that the browser is securely holding on to the information. Users don't have to worry about, do I trust this merchant with my information? Right? Because they typically tend to trust their own phones. So the phone is what's hanging on to it. So one tap pops up and says, OK, done. Confirmed shipping. You're finished. It's in Chrome on Android. Web payments is also in Chrome on desktop. But it turns out that there's a bug right now that it doesn't work quite right. So we knew about it. It showed up after we shipped. Um, you know, It should be fixed in the, next re in the next release. But as of 56, it's just not quite right on the desktop. So the first time the user inputs it. Uh, no, into, the, into this pop-up in the browser. Now, normally what happens is, and you've probably seen this, is that if you fill in credit card information, autofill notices it and actually retains the information to offer it to you as an option next time. So it can pick it up that way as well. So if a site doesn't have payment API, I could have filled in my card there, and payment API would actually know about the card. Now, the nice thing about this is it's a very secure, it, sends, it doesn't send the card information to the merchant. It sends a one-time use token, the same as if you use a chip card. Yeah. Right? The chip cards, that, that all generates a one-time use token so that even if somebody stole it, they couldn't reuse that number for payment. Same thing happens here. It's actually a highly secure system. <coughs> so credential management API is the other really interesting one. It's one-tap sign-in. So I go to ta I tap on the user, and up pops the thing that you just saw that says, sign in with Google Smart Lock. You say yes, and you're signed in. A lot easier than going and looking up your name and password. OK, how many people use a unique name and password for almost every site? Yeah, no hands. <laughs> because it's hard, right? You have to remember it. I mean, I use a password manager. But I always have to go and open it up and log into it and copy the password and or you know show it on the screen and type it in. And it's a pain. But I do it because my things need to be really secure. 
working for a big company like Google, you actually need to be super, super security conscious because everybody wants to know what we're doing. They all want our secrets. So, you know, unique passwords on everything. Um, this, though, I can have a unique password on everything. And Google Smart Lock, which is an internal password manager on the phone, says, OK, I know your passwords are things. Here, I can log you in. Because you have your phone, you've unlocked your phone, you've used a pattern or a password or your fingerprint, you know, whatever sensors are used to identify you. So the phone knows who you are. Now it can sign you into these sites. So these, the question is, these are in Chrome. What about other browsers? Um, so Web Payments API is Chrome and Netscape, and I'd have to look at the rest. Safari actually has a Payments API. It's slightly different. Credential management in Chrome, I believe it's also in Netscape. These are all W3C standards. So one of the really important things is, you know, we've, we're very driven now by standards. Now, standards take a lot more work, right? We could just sit down, build a feature, and be done. You know, standards take a couple of years or more. But they're worth it because you can get that feature across all the browsers, and you can get the community adoption. So they're worth the trouble to us. So progressive web apps are designed to be reliable, fast loading, work offline and on flaky networks, so inconsistent networks. You want to build them fast. Use smooth animation, 60 frame per second rendering so it's not stuttering or getting, as we call it, janky. It's not getting stuck. Um, and it should be interesting, right? It should be engaging. It should, la it should launch quickly from the home screen. It should send push notifications that draw the user back in if you need them. Right? These are kind of the ground rules for a good progressive web app. So how do you do the fast animation with a PWA? Um, that's a kind of a long answer. The short answer is this, that you get, you get 60 frames a second. You want, that's, the, that's the target you're aiming for, which means that's a 16 millisecond slice, one six. Now, out of that, there's some overhead for the browser and all that. So really, you have to fit within about 10 milliseconds. And so you budget that 10 milliseconds out. If you need to, you cut the work up into small enough pieces that fit in there. Um, or you put work in something like a web worker that runs off the main thread, that pre-calculates what you need, and then makes the changes. Um, a lot of times, you use like a virtual DOM. So how many people here use React? So React uses a virtual DOM. It's a technique from the gaming industry that can calculate the minimum set of changes needed for the DOM and make just those. CSS3 can help you to achieve this using things like transitions. There are tools in Chrome for actually monitoring performance, and they'll tell you when you start exceeding that budget. Um, because you're, you're connected with Google, right? You can ask for a performance audit. And we'll, uh, for bigger properties, we'll actually do performance audits. Now, don't, don't everybody in the room ask at once. There's only a few people that do those audits, but we do actually do them. Um, there's also a course on Udacity called Browser Rendering Optimization. It's one of the, it's one of the courses that I produced. Um, and it will work in extreme detail on taking applications and getting them down to that beautiful, smooth 60 frames per second. And it's a free, it's a free course. So the question was about security and service worker. And can I keep certain requests out of the service worker? Can I make sure they're not intercepted? Um, the answer is yes. You can tell the service worker to only watch one path in your application. So anything that happens outside of that path is not intercepted by that service worker. You can actually have in the current version of Chrome, but this is still being standardized, so the other browsers don't have it yet because it's still the standard's still being locked down. You can actually run multiple service workers on different paths of your app for different caching. Um, and service workers require, they mandate HTTPS because the last thing you want to have happen is somebody else injects an insecure script into your service worker and suddenly they've taken over your network stack. So it has to be served up securely. So why is this important? How do we get started? The importance is, as I said earlier, reach, getting the apps into people's hands. One billion monthly mobile Chrome users. Now, 
add the people who use UC, add the people who use you know, other browsers. That's a huge number. In terms of unique visitors, we said three, typically about three apps people are using on their phones. They'll use like 100 pages at least. You know, very typically, they'll keep coming back to the same nine or 10 sites and using them frequently. So you could, much easier to get into this side than that side. <clears throat> cost of acquisition. Um, so Celio did a study on user acquisition costs. Cost about four euros per Android user and about 0.35 for mobile web users. So let's see, can I do that in rupees? I'm not quite. So this would be about 20 rupees, if I'm doing my math correctly. Now conversion. AliExpress actually did a progressive website, doubled the page views, 75% almost increase in time spent on the site. That's actually pretty important. <coughs> What's interesting is this. You asked earlier, well, is this on every browser? And it's not. And so you might think, well, does it help on Safari? Redesigning into a progressive web app. So the things you have to think about when you build a PWA basically make you a better web app overall. And so they actually got 82% more conversions on iOS than they had before. So that's a lot more business. And basically what they said is, we can do it. We can have huge benefits on browsers with the latest features. But it also works across other, other browsers. And it's just going to keep getting better as the browsers keep improving. So as soon as Safari brings Service Worker in, suddenly it'll work great there too. <clears throat> so how do we get started? Well, two ways to do it. One is build from the ground up. So Conga actually built. Um, a native app started from a native application and built a PWA to match it. Much smaller load, much smaller initial app load, a lot less data to complete the first transaction because on the web you have more control over what's happening in the network stack. Another option is to build a very simple app. Just start with something simple. Air Berlin's example for boarding passes, less than one second to load. Washington Post used AMP as the basis. And typical load time, 80 milliseconds for an article. It's great. By the way, what's the, what's the number? What's the cutoff? If you want your page to look like it loads instantly, what's the minimum speed you want to shoot for? What's the load time? Anyone know? 100 milliseconds. Tenth of a second. Sorry? Actually, it's 100. Because it turns out, here's, a, here's your odd fact for the day. It takes about 80 to 100 milliseconds for a nerve impulse to travel from like the end of your leg to your brain. But you have to be able to walk and do things like now. So how do you deal with the fact that everything is a little bit delayed coming up the nervous system? your brain actually will delay inputs up to 100 milliseconds in your brain to get everything to line up. So the, the science experiment to try sometime is if you touch your nose and your ankle at the same time, if you do this and you feel them at the same time, the nerve signals actually arrived 80 milliseconds apart. Your brain is lying to you. <laughs> You're actually living about one tenth of a second in the past. And that's why a page load under 100 milliseconds, person clicks on it, brain says, oh, that was instant. Because it took 100 milliseconds, but the brain connected the hand activity with what it saw and said, oh, those must have been simultaneous. It's great when you can do it, especially if you show it to a client, because they click the button, it's like, boom. Like, what? I remember shocking a client that way, just doing it that fast. And they looked at me like, what? Oh my god, what is this black magic? 
I said, I can't tell you. And I did tell them. Or you could pick one feature at a time to convert. So the weather company <clears throat> just added push and rolled out 30 languages globally with her web push notifications. And you know, that's nice because you can do things like weather alerts, <coughs> right? Tornado coming. Booking.com did things one by one and, and had a fantastic time building out their app, just one feature at a time. So you can go from the ground up, you can build a very simple app, or you can do a single feature. It's up to you. But look at all the companies, and this was as of I.O. last year. So this is almost a year old, and look at how many companies are doing progressive web apps, some of which you've worked with and heard of. So let's go do it. Let's go build. So where to start? The question is about the storage space and how you manage it. Yeah. And the example is if I have an e-commerce site and somebody looks at a large number of products, maybe they look at 100 products, right? What's that going to do to the storage of my device? Because device storage is not that big relative to a desktop. So there are storage limits, and it depends on the browser. If memory serves, your storage limit for something like Safari um, or Firefox by default is about 50 megabytes. It's not gigabytes, it's megabytes. So you have, to, you have to be pretty frugal with what you're doing. On Chrome, the last thing that I heard is basically half of the remaining disk space is what you get. Um, so Chrome will give you more, but you still have to keep it pretty small. Now what do you do in the case of the e-commerce site where somebody's looking at a lot of information? So there is a tool that we'll look at later called SW Toolbox. It's a bunch of code that makes it very easy to set up different caches. So the cache from my application code might be everything goes in and stays in. But then I might have a cache for products, and I say that cache has a certain size limit or a lifetime limit um, or a number of items limit, and Toolbox will actually manage that for you. So in your case, you would probably set a, a storage budget and say, OK, my storage budget is this much. And however many products fit into that storage budget, that's what the user sees. So maybe they don't see everything they've looked at. Maybe they see the most recent 20. But we'll manage it for you. Right, the question is, can you segregate the cache? Yes, you can actually have the cache API lets you build set multiple caches at the same time. So I would have one cache, which is my, my main files. And that lifetime is probably forever, or as close as forever as we, we want to get. And then my product cache maybe has a limited lifetime or a limited size. And I could have multiple caches. 